Welcome everyone to the in-person CPV seminar edition. Um, so today I'm delighted to introduce Will, Will de Rocco from uh, UC Santa Cruz. So Will uh, recently did his PhD at uh, Stanford with Peter Graham and Sajid Rajendran um, and has Santa Cruz has been various interesting dark matter related things, non-dark matter related things. Um, and today I think he's, we're gonna be straying more into non-dark matter Territory. Well, we'll see. Yeah, you'll hear both. Yeah, yeah. you'll hear um, both. And learn all about microlensing. So, sit your hands. Uh, okay, fantastic. So, yeah, Karen, thank you very much for introducing me and for hosting me here. It's an absolute pleasure to be back. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm William Duraco. I'm a postdoc at UCSC. I'm just finishing my time at UCSC. I'll be headed off to Maryland and Johns Hopkins after that. Um, and over the past year, year and a half, I've been working uh, a lot on what I call exploring the dark side with high cadence microlensing. So before, before I dive into the meat of the talk, I'm going to provide a little bit of motivation for why this is something that we might want to start thinking. All right. So I'm going to start by talking about primordial black holes here. All right. Primordial black holes, which are just black holes that are formed early in the universe from some new physics process um, are an appealing candidate for dark matter. Uh, they're fairly generic, depending on what sort of models you believe for the early universe. I'll talk more about these later. Um, but they can constitute a large fraction of the dark matter. And you might have seen a plot, something like this before, which gives you the mass of primordial black holes as a, um, and on the y-axis, the fraction of the dark matter that can be composed of primordial black holes at that mass, right? Um, and so in the middle there, all of those bounds come from something called microlensing, which is gonna be the topic of today's talk. Um, but I want to open up by making perhaps a provocative statement or at least asking a provocative question. And that is, have we already observed primordial black holes? Okay, and you'll notice that between the previous plot and this one, something new appeared. It is this dotted circle here that says Ogle question mark. So what is that? That is a set of microlensing observations. This comes from a paper in 2019 by Nikura et al. Um, where they identified six anomalous microlensing events that were consistent with uh, an interpretation as primordial black holes, all right? And so in their paper, they actually make a fairly bold statement, which is Earth mass PBHs can well reproduce the six ultra short time scale events. Our result gives a first hint of PBH existence. Big if true, right? That would be very exciting to be our first glimpse into the actual nature of dark matter. Um, However, I think that the first question that anybody would ask when you hear a claim like this is, well, how can we know? How can we be sure these are actually primordial black holes that we're seeing? And I think what's been very interesting for me as I've been pursuing this question is, and what else might we find along the way? So this is the primary motivation for what I'm going to be talking about today. This is a series of papers that I've written and a bunch of ongoing efforts that sort of have uh, octopus out into a lot of different research directions. Um, but I just want to provide a, a sort of brief outline of what to expect from the talk today. In part one, we're going to cover gravitational microlensing, what it is, how it works. In part two, we're going to talk about non-luminous lenses and other targets that are particularly good for going after with microlensing. Um, in part three, uh, we will be talking about uh, attempts to repurpose observations to look for such events. And then uh, in part four, we're going to be talking about how to actually try to pull out multiple subpopulations from microlensing data in order to robustly answer uh, uh, sort of the nature of events like this. Um, and something I do notice is that, okay, I have a watch on, so we can try to keep, keep time. There was no clock in the room. Um, so good. So with that, let's dive in to part one, which is on gravitational microlensing. However, uh, before we get into gravitational microlensing, let's just start with gravitational lensing. So this is a pretty well-known effect um, that is a general relativistic effect that's just due to the fact that massive objects 
bend the light around them, right? One result of general relativity is that just like everything else, light falls. Um, and so what that means is that if you have a configuration like this, where there is some luminous source off in the distance, some star in the galactic bulge, something like that, right? And it is emitting light, and I'm showing two light rays here, sort of dotted lines. If there is a massive object somewhere in between the source and us on Earth, as the light rays move around it, they will bend. They'll be tugged by the gravitational field of that intermediate object, okay? And then be refocused towards Earth. And so this is known as gravitational lensing, because if you look at this, actually, um, this can sort of be treated as just a standard optics problem, as if you had just some lens there that was focusing the light from the source. Uh, and the size of that lens on the sky uh, is something known as the Einstein radius. So this is sort of the angular size on the sky. Um, this is theta e. It is a function of the mass of the lens. So the more massive the lens, the bigger your effective lens radius is, which sort of makes sense. You're doing more tugging. Um, the distance to the lens, dl, and the distance to the source, ds. Okay. So what does this actually look like for an observer on Earth? Well, what it looks like is if you are sitting on Earth and you trace these, uh, these light rays back, right? You don't know about the bending. So what you see are two different images projected on the sky, all right? This is sort of the regime of strong lensing. So when the lens passes in front, you get multiple images on the sky, all right? And in fact, this is just a two-dimensional cross-section. So you could imagine that if you actually cut right down the middle, you get some nice, beautiful ring, right? And this is called the Einstein ring, right? And it is a uh, sort of a telltale feature that said, yeah, Einstein was right. General relativity is a real thing. We're getting this light bending. We've uh, been able to, to um, you know, take pictures of these beautiful Einstein rings. Um, and so it, it all confirms that. But all of this is in the regime of what's called strong gravitational lensing, where you have these multiple images. As the mass moves, uh, sorry, um, as the mass gets uh, lower and lower and lower, these images get closer and closer and closer together. And so eventually, the mass gets low enough that the multiple images actually overlap with the source. All right? You can't individually resolve them any longer. And so what does this look like to us on Earth? Well, it looks like the apparent magnification of the source, because now you have the source's light as well as the images stacked on top. So it just looks brighter. Okay? So this is the regime of microlensing, where you can no longer individually resolve the images. What you see instead is an apparent magnification of a source. Okay? In the point source regime, where you can treat that very distant object as effectively just a point on the sky, all right, um, you can actually derive analytically what this light curve should look like. When I say light curve, I just mean brightness is a function of time, flux is a function of time, right? So I'm going to show you how this works here with a little bit of a video. Um, on the top, you're going to see this bright source in the background. A dark object is going to move in front, cause lensing. The top is what you would be able to see if you could perfectly resolve the actual features. And the bottom is the actual sort of summed magnification that you end up with. So we see here, there's this bright object. This dark thing moves in front. You get multiple images here. You get a nice, beautiful Einstein ring in the middle. And then it moves off, and eventually you lose it. And it just looks like a star again. And on the bottom, you have what's called the Pachinsky curve. This is the analytic derivation. Um, that you can get for a, a, a point source um, in the sky. And it was derived by Bonard Pachinsky um, a long time ago. And he, I would strongly encourage you to look up because he's a really interesting guy sort of in the history of science. Um, has a very interesting story. And so this is aptly named after him. Um, and so you have this sort of telltale symmetric feature, right? Which uh, sort of constitutes the the fundamental observable of a microlensing event. And so what is that observable really? Well, it's basically a time scale at the end of the day, OK? You don't get the microphysics just from the light curve. What you get is some brightening for some amount of time, right? And so this time is typically TE, or the Einstein crossing time. 
right? Which is the amount of time it takes for that distant source to move across that Einstein radius that we talked about, okay? That sets your effective scale for, uh, for how long these events are, okay? Mu rel here is just the proper motion. So this event time scale is the primary observable quantity. And I want to drive that home because it really reinforces why you need to move towards high cadence observations to, low, to, uh, to observe low mass objects, all right? As we said, the size of that Einstein radius depends on the mass of the object, the mass of your lens, right? So as you get to low masses, the time scales get shorter and shorter and shorter. However, microlensing is intrinsically an extremely rare phenomenon. So what you need to do usually is observe a lot of stars at high photometric precision, which means that you have to basically say, all right, I'm gonna look at a bunch of patches on the sky and I'm gonna go back to them every once in a while in a big circle and check and see if there's a bright moon, okay? That pattern of taking, you know, of returning to a given star is known as the observational cadence. And um, it's critical for setting the lower mass that you're gonna be sensitive to. Because let's say you're looking for, you know, a Jupiter mass object, right? That's tens of hours. If you've got an hour long cadence, you're fine. You'll get a bunch of data points, you'll get a nice light curve, you can measure it. All good. As you get down to Earth masses, though, these events are lasting for tens of minutes, right? So if you've got an hour-long cadence, you're just going to miss it, right? Um, and given that I provided this motivation about these anomalous PBH events, et cetera, that's roughly Earth masses. And that means that we really need to be pushing down towards, uh, towards um, high cadence uh, in order to actually have a chance of understanding what these things are. Now, everything I've said so far has been in this point source regime where you can treat that star on the sky as just a dot, right? Which is usually a pretty good approximation. And said more sort of uh, more mathematically, you can treat it as a dot so long as it's much smaller than that Einstein radius, right? However, at low masses, like I said, that Einstein radius is getting smaller. And so you actually reach a point where the angular size of that star on the sky is pretty comparable to or larger than the, the uh, Einstein radius itself. And you move into what's called the finite source regime, okay? So the finite source effects have pretty profound uh, consequences for the light curve. I'm trying to indicate it here, uh, at least one of them, which is in the point source regime, what sets your time scale? It's the crossing of that point source through a big Einstein radius, right? In the finite source regime, it's actually the opposite. You've got a tiny Einstein radius, a tiny lens, and some big looking source on the sky. And so the duration of your brightening is how long it takes that lens to cross, which means that your, uh, your event is sort of artificially lengthened in comparison to what you'd expect from just the size of the Einstein radius alone, right? Additionally, it unfortunately results in a lower peak magnification. And the reason for that is that in this case, when that source is inside the blue, you get to lens the entire, all the magnification of that star, right? In the opposite case, you only ever lens some small portion of the surface of the star, right? So this, uh, this blue lens moves across and you're only gonna get some tiny fraction there, right? Um, so because of that, you have a lower peak magnification. So this just sounds bad, right? Just sounds like we don't want that. It's going to be hard to detect, lower peak magnification, finite source effects are the worst. We don't want them. However, while true, there actually is sort of a, an odd benefit to the finite source effects, which is that by changing the shape of the light curve here, you can see it's sort of a weekly, sort of in the weak finite source regime, we have this flattening like a plateau, it gets broadened out a little bit. Um, interestingly, the actual shape of that curve has information about the Einstein radius itself, all right? And that's really useful because there's a lot of degeneracies in microlensing. When all you see is a time scale, but you have a bunch of fundamental parameters that you want to be able to try to estimate, it's kind of hard. So there's usually a threefold degeneracy where let's say you want to make a mass estimate, which seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. You want to know how heavy the thing is that just caused a microlensing event. Well, you've got the time scale, 
that's great. But you've actually got a degeneracy with the distance of the lens and the proper motion of the lens, okay? So that's another set of degeneracies that you really can't break and means that trying to make any mass estimates is tough. It's really tough. Sorry, can I ask a question if I'm allowed to, of course? You are more than, yes, more than welcome to. Hi, um, uh, so, um, but you also know the luminosity of the parent star when it's not lensed, right? Yeah. So doesn't that allow you to get an estimate of break the degeneracy? No. No, no. The intrinsic flux, so this is a magnification of the sort of baseline flux of the star. So knowing the baseline doesn't actually help you very much. I mean, it's good for blending fractions, but that's sort of a different, okay. different thing. So right. it's, all, it's all a relative, you know, magnification. Okay. That's yeah. Good. Um, so, so yeah, so you have this degeneracy. However, if you have finite source effects and you can measure this theta E, you've broken one of those degeneracies already. And then all you need is a distance of the lens and you can get, for example, a mass estimate. Now, I will say you still don't know the distance of the lens. However, of all the things to not know, that's one which, uh, we have a pretty good bracket on because it's definitely between here and wherever the source star is. So, you know, that's going to be between zero and roughly eight kiloparsecs if you're looking at something in the bulge. But we can do better, right? And so the question is, how do you do better? Um, the way you do better is by actually measuring the distance of the lens, and you do that via parallax. So parallax is a, probably a pretty familiar phenomenon to a lot of you, um, although just in case there aren't you know, a lot of observational astronomers in the audience here. Um, the idea is that if you're looking at some target, right, say your thumb or whatever, and you're projecting it on some distant background, so much further away, then if you look at it from two different perspectives, it seems as if that object has moved with respect to that background, okay? Easy way to make a distance measurement. And so it's the way that usually astronomers make distance measurements. However, generally what they do is they say, all right, well, we'll take a picture, you know, in September, and then let's just wait until uh, March or May or something like that. When we're on the other side of the sun and we have this huge baseline and we take another picture and we compare those two pictures and say, well, on some distant galaxy or whatever, that point has moved back and forth. We know how far away it is, right? Great. Orbital parallax is a, is a great way of measuring parallax. It's very precise. But here's the catch, right? If you're looking for a 10-minute event, you don't have that option, right? You do not have the option to use the orbit because you're not going to be able to wait around that long to actually build some good baseline. So if you really want to measure the distance to the lens, you need two simultaneous observations from different locations, um, which really motivates having multiple telescopes pointing in the same direction, trying to make these measurements. And so that's one of the topics that, that I'm currently working on, but um, will not necessarily be the, the, the focus of this talk. I just wanted to reinforce it. Okay, so that brings me to the end of part one which should give you everything you need to know on microlensing. Um, however, I will pause here because if there's any questions, now would be a great time to ask them uh, so that when we move on, everyone's not just you know hor horrifically confused. Are you, are you going to be considering lenses and sources where like the proper motion going into that formula is gonna be dominated by the lens? Are you ever gonna have situations where you have like sources and lenses moving with kind of comparable motions? Um, I mean, they, they certainly can, right? Because the, well, it, it sort of depends on your target. Um, you know, if you're using like a stellar source, but you're looking for dark matter that's moving like 270, you know, um, that sort of typical period of velocity, like then I think the dark matter is going to dominate. But, you know, if you're looking for other things that we'll get to, um, I think it's, it can be fairly comparable. It's all relative, though, so it doesn't yeah. really matter that much. I mean, Earth motion obviously also matters, too. Oh, Roland, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to check. Um, so uh, for what scale of 
uh, mass scale, is it the case that um, the projected Einstein radius is going to be uh, outside the, you know, the projected um, uh, angular size of a, like a planet or something? I mean, if you if you see a, if you see a gravitational lens with a an Earth mass, can, do you know that it's not a a, a free floating planet, or could it could it be a free floating planet? You know, I'll get I mean. to that question in a little bit later. Let's talk about that in a moment. Okay. In fact, I think that's a great segue into the next session. Cool. So, part two. Uh, what can we actually go after with this? Well, I mentioned one thing already. That's dark matter, specifically the primordial black holes, although any others really don't have dark matter this works for. It's just a purely gravitational effect. Um, as I said, primordial black holes are a motivated candidate for dark matter, depending on what sorts of things you believe to be motivations. Um, there's a lot of mechanisms to make them in the early universe, that's for sure. You can use phase transitions, you can have domain walls or cosmic strings that collapse, you can have vacuum bubbles. Um, but I think the one that most people usually associate with primordial black holes is the collapse of overdensities after inflation. Um, the idea here being that, okay, if you have some inflationary potential, and there's some divot on it or something like that, some scale that's picked out. Um, you can have the inflaton sit there for a little while. You can build up uh, um, a lot of energy density at this scale. When that scale re-enters the horizon, it collapses, forms a primordial black hole, all right? Now, okay, one thing that I think is important about pretty much all of these formation mechanisms is that generically they are set by a particular scale, whether it's the scale of the, you know, the, the temperature of the phase transition or wherever your inflationary divot was, et cetera. And so because of that, PBHs are usually predicted to have sort of a, a narrow distribution around that scale in terms of mass. Um, and so, for example, in the case of the overdensities collapsing, this is usually a log normal distribution with a narrow width centered at some mass, right? So, as I've said, they're primarily searched for via microlensing. I think hopefully now that makes a lot of sense why. Here's that plot again, where at the very high mass end, you see constraints from cosmology. The very low mass end, you see constraints from the fact that, you know, Hawking famously showed that, uh, that black holes evaporate, and so they would actually have all evaporated away or would be making high energy particles we could detect. Um, and then in the middle there, about 10 orders of magnitude, Really, the strongest observational limits that we have right now all come from microlensing. Possibly not surprising. I mean, these things are dark, heavy objects floating through space. Something that's a purely gravitational effect is pretty useful. Um, but as we said, microlensing has also seen something. And that are these sort of bizarre six short duration events that are apparently consistent with primordial black holes. However, um, you know, I showed you this, and I quoted this from the paper. It's a direct quote. However, I was a bit uh, duplicitous in my quotation of this, because you'll notice that there are three little uh, ellipses there, right? So what was the actual quote? Well, the actual quote was, Earth mass PBHs can well reproduce the six ultra short time scale events without the need of free-floating planets. Our result gives a fruit. And so we need to talk about free-floating planets, something that was just brought up. What are those? Well, in order to understand these, we need to understand a little bit about planetary formation, which uh, I can tell you is a lot more complicated than you might expect, and we are going to avoid most of. I'm just gonna say planetary formation is extremely chaotic. You start in this protoplanetary disk, um, where sort of uh, uh, sequentially uh, you build bigger and bigger planetesimals and then sort of like protoplanets. Um, and, uh, and they're all interacting, they're all colliding with, the, with uh, one another, and then sort of when the density gets low enough, they're going to be primarily interacting with rotational scatterings. Um, and you all probably know the three body problem is already. So you can imagine that the you know, 100 billion body problem is wildly chaotic. And because of that, a lot of the gravitational interactions um, sort of preferentially lead to planetesimal ejection. 
the lowest mass thing that is interacting via these, these scatterings is going to get kicked entirely out of the system. All right. Now, this is a shockingly efficient process, all right, where it's actually suggested that um, per star system, you end up with something like 10 Earth mass planets ejected fully from the system for every bound one, right? So the amount of free floating Earth mass planets wildly dominates the amount that remain bound, okay? This is something that I think uh, is, is often not really appreciated, um, even in the exoplanet community, where when I've chatted with exoplanet people, they're like, wow, yeah, that's, that's a lot of planets. And the answer is, yes, it's actually a higher abundance than any of the ones that are bound. Um, you know, it sort of has some interesting implications that if you're going after the nearest planet to Earth, it's probably not an Alpha Centauri, it's probably somewhere closer. Yeah. What time scale, like on which time scale do you actually eject these planets? You, it, it depends a lot. Um, usually it's either during disk dis dispersal or shortly afterwards when gravitational instabilities are still prominent. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you can also have situations where very late in, in um, very late in the system's life, you know, there's an eccentricity is excited and then there's some sort of stellar flyby or something that rips one off. But the primary ejection mechanisms happen early on. So how many millions of years is that? Uh, like tens of millions of years, something like that. Yeah, it can be, I mean, it's a, a wide range and it's something that we don't fully understand. There's actually somebody I was chatting with briefly who, uh, whose paper came out today and I would say is one of the, the absolute best FFP formation papers I've ever seen. So I would highly recommend you all read Gavin Coleman's paper. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So fairly early in the lifetime of these systems. And that's one of the reasons that they're actually an extremely motivated candidate to look for just for exoplanets alone, because this is a very short lived phase and it's very hard to observe directly. So you have some sort of fossil imprint of it in the distribution of free floating planets. So if you can measure all the free floating planets, you have a unique snapshot of an otherwise very hard to observe but critical phase um, in planetary dynamics that lead to the planetary architectures we have today. That's also a, sort of a, another project I'm leading right now. And, and how many of these systems do we see at the moment? Like how many do, do we observe? Wait for it. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I mean, this leads to some some interesting implications. There are more unbound terrestrial mass planets than bound. Um, and I also spent like four hours making a nice little sort of a simulation here so you can see an ejection happen where it's going to go around and it's going to come back through and then around and boom, it's out. Good. So now you understand what gravitational ejection is. So, yeah, for them, though, right? There's this huge abundance that should be out there. We should be able to see them. So for 20 years now, there's been a concerted microlensing effort to look for lots of things, but amongst it, FFPs. Um, the three primary microlensing surveys that have been operating are OGLE, um, which is based in, well, based in Poland, although that's not where the telescopes are, um, KMTNet, which is a Korean uh, initiative, and uh, MOA, which is sort of a joint New Zealand and Japanese initiative. Um, and these have been staring for a, a long time long time, right? So the question is, have we seen anything? I'll place bets. Do you mean detection of planets by microlensing? Because they have been seen. Well, there's, yeah, bound planets for sure. And no, we don't need to actually, you don't have to place to bets. It's okay. I just want to give you the opportunity if you wanted to. Um, so what I'll say is, yes, actually, we have seen a few things. Um, specifically FFP-related things. Um, but it's only recently, and it's only because recently these collaborations have been able, just due to telescopic uh, constraints, uh, to lower their cadence to 15 minutes. And so because of that, now that we're starting to probe these sort of minutes, hours, time scales, you can see from what I was discussing earlier that we're opening this window for terrestrial mass FFPs, okay? So the first observations of, of uh, microlensing events that are consistent with an Earth mass object were made um, you know, over the last 10 years, however, only sort of fully extracted and analyzed in the last four or so. Um, so it's a new field, right? Uh, it's kind of exciting that this is 
we're sort of on the eve of discovery with all of this. Um, however, so what we've seen so far is that FFPs follow roughly a power law, and this is much to be expected from the gravitational scattering that produces them, right? You can imagine that lower mass things are preferentially better scattered. So you have some sort of power law, which is preferential towards low masses. It's harder and harder and harder to scatter heavy things because you need heavier things to scatter them. So a good fiducial model, if you are ever um, at a cocktail party and you need to impress somebody with how many FFPs there are, would be to say there's about 10 Earth mass free floating planets per star. And that DND log M falls off with like uh, the inverse of the mass. Okay. Now, granted, large error bars on this, but this is a good sort of rule of thumb to keep in the back of your head, right? Now, I will say though, I mean, the error bars are very large because we have very few observations. So it's a little bit frustrating. We would certainly like to do better. And I have very good news for all of you. We will um, very soon, in fact. So there's a lot more to come, and that is thanks to the Roman Space Telescope, which is NASA's next flagship mission after James Webb. Um, however, in contrast to James Webb, which was, what, 20 years delayed, this one is actually on time. And as someone who's been working in it, um, I can say it's looking pretty on time. So the launch is scheduled for October 2026, um, which is very soon. This is two years away. And one of its primary science drivers is something called the Galactic Bulge Time Domain Survey. Um, this is going to be a dedicated campaign uh, of microlensing of the galactic bulge, right? And it will be by far the most extensive, precise microlensing survey that we as a human species have ever done. Um, so as a result of that, it is expected to observe something like several hundred to some estimates suggest a thousand free floating planets during its five year operation. And that's not even talking about, you know, potential extended missions, et cetera. So we're going to have data soon. It's not going to be just a handful of events. We're going to be able to truly characterize the mass function of free floating planets. And again, that's something that I'm leading right now with, uh, with collaborators at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, can I ask a question again? So sure. how would you, like really make sure, how do you really characterize it? I mean, in and and not something else. Like, I, I have to be absolutely certain that it's a free floating planet. Like, is it obvious that this method is, you know, like, will tell you that this is indeed a free floating planet and nothing else? So, so let's just keep going with the talk. Just bear with me a little bit here. I've been leading you on, but we will get there. I can promise. Right. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then we can we can chat more about it. Okay, so sorry, to return to this slide yet again, um, now we at least understand what was in the ellipses, right? Which is, okay, yes, PBHs can explain this without the need for free floating planets. Although you might want to know, well, but which one is it, right? And so that was sort of one of the goals of one of the projects that I was leading. Um, however, I'm gonna pause here before we sort of get into all of that. Uh, and take any questions that you might have on black holes, free floating planets, et cetera. Yes. Is microlensing the only, the only way we have now to see free floating planets? Like there's no other so see it fly by, I guess. But. There, is a, uh, there is a bit of an issue with nomenclature, I would say, which is that free floating planets uh, is a term that is used broadly for two kinds of objects. One is heavy planetary mass objects that form in situ, basically as failed stars. They're like the very low mass end of the brown dwarf. Um, and because of that, they can actually retain, they can be hot enough when they form that you can observe them in the infrared. And so recently, actually, James Webb has seen way too many of them, way more than we expected, um, including some in binaries, which got a lot of you know, New York Times press on jumbos, Jupiter mass binary objects and such. Um, and so technically, these are known as free-floating planets. I personally do not count them. I consider them failed stars. I consider free-floating planets planets that were once bound and were then ejected. And for those, the only observational way that we have to probe them, since they are small and dark, is microlensing. This um, uh, Roman 
bulge yeah. surveys? Is this just one project within the Roman surveys? There are, like the LMC and stuff like there that? are four. There are four primary Roman surveys that are going to be conducted. This is one of them. There is also the high latitude survey, which is mainly, I think, for supernovae to get a better H and measurement. There's the uh, something or like the variables. That one is, and then there's the recently announced uh, galactic disk survey, which I don't think anyone has decided yet what is the big science case there, but we're gonna look at the disk too. So if you have good motivations to do so, that's, we'll have data. But I mean, that survey will dramatically improve the knowledge of the free floating brown dwarf population as well. The, 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 Roman, the, the Roman survey that you mentioned. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. And actually, so one of the projects that I'm leading right now is disentangling the failed start population from the sort of like ejected population um, via Roman. Um, no, trust me, Roman, I mean, I'm on the Roman bandwagon here, but like it will do a lot of science for a lot of different things. It's not just FFPs, right? It's also a lot of bound planets as well. Um, and I should say that even though it's a microlensing survey, well, okay, you know what? I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. It's worth noting for everyone here that Sanjeev Shana is one of those kinky Roman as well at the moment. He was here for 14 years, he's now at Roman. So if you want to get inside information on, he put a bunch of us on proposals because of his history here. Wow, fantastic. So, yeah. Shana, he just left, he was here for two months. And he's a senior, one of the senior people on NASA Roman, Charles Hopkins, space telescope. Is it Johns Hopkins? I, I don't know exactly what his, I think it's his faculty. Okay. So it could be space telescope. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm headed to Johns Hopkins as my next postdoc. Yeah, so I think he's a faculty. Area. I think, strictly speaking, he's faculty at Space Telescope and Johns Hopkins adjunct. I think that's the title. Okay, fantastic, cool. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's nice, that's sort of the, the hub of Roman right now, because Goddard is kind of the- but He's leading the disc proposal, but uh, so I agree with what you're saying. About the bulge. That's very important. Yeah, I know the Roman. I will out myself and say a, a new Roman merchandise uh, portal just opened up, and I did buy myself a Roman hoodie because I'm that excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> that excited about it. You didn't mention Euclid. Do you think Euclid's sufficiently? So, Euclid is really interesting for the point I made earlier about parallax measurements. All right. You, but but maybe we should chat. I don't want to get too distracted here. Um, so maybe we should chat afterwards or something. Euclid has the potential to really improve our ability to characterize the mass function if they'll do a simultaneous pointing with us. Okay. But they're a little bit dodgy on whether or not they're going to be able to do that. And they're not a dedicated microlensing survey, so I get it. Um, anyways, part three. Part three. Okay, so look, we're gonna get good statistics, we're gonna get them soon, but soon is also not that soon, right? I mean, it launches in two years and it's a five-year campaign. And I mean, look, if you know me at all, you know that I'm a little bit impatient, right? So one question that I asked myself was, well, is there anything I can do right now to try to better understand this population, better probe uh, these questions? And that led me to sort of an unusual place which is TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Um, this is a satellite that was launched by NASA in 2018. It's been operating continuously since. And it looks for exoplanets, bound exoplanets, very close to their star, via something called the transit method, which is pretty much a glorified way of looking at little eclipses, right? You're measuring the star, the thing passes in front of the star, it blots out a little bit of the star, so you see a dip, and then it goes away. And you see a bunch of these because it's bound very tightly. Um, and you can look for you can look for periodic dips in brightness. And TESS has been wildly successful. It has observed, um, I think it's detected 3,000, 4,000, something like that, planets in this method. Um, and so that's all well and good. However, I just want you to take a moment to look at this curve, all right? Because to me, kind of looks like an upside down micro lensing curve. And so, yeah, at the end of the day, transit events are really just inverted lensing events in the fact that if you have really good photometric precision, right, meaning you can change, you can see tiny changes in magnification, and you have high cadence, which means you can actually tile the whole curve, 
then you can also do micro lensing. And so that has led to me uh, starting a project which I call making a mess out of tests, uh, making a micro lensing survey out of a transit survey. Um, and really, TESS is uniquely suited to this because um, it's observed like uh, 40 million stars at this point at down to three minute cadence. Three minutes, which is even lower than um, Roman is, is going to be able to do. Roman will be a 15 minute cadence no matter what. Um, although, well, maybe not no matter what, but like pretty much no matter what. Um, additionally, there's a huge benefit to doing it from space, which is the fact that the atmosphere is horrible. So ground-based telescopes usually need to have like a 10% magnification, peak magnification to be detectable. For things like TESS or Roman, I mean, less than 0.1%, sometimes considerably, is completely detectable, um, which really opens the opportunity to probe a lot more of these kinds of events. So I've been collaborating with one of the lead researchers on the TESS pipeline, Michelle Kunamoto, pictured here. Um, and we have been working pretty hard to get some exciting results on this by going through archival test data and instead of looking for transits, looking for microlensing events. Um, sort of at a twiddly level, uh, it's not crazy. We would expect that in sort of all existing um, um, test data right now, you might be able to detect 10 or so, you know, terrestrial and subterrestrial uh, FFP events. Um, and whatever the yield is, whether it be a null result or 10 of these things, um, it will really help inform Roman survey strategy in terms of calibrating how many they should expect to see. Um, and I will also say, I know I'm being recorded here, so hopefully no one, uh, well, okay. Well, there's this plot first. It also probes primordial black holes. Remember, this is where the talk started. Um, so yes, if this population of primordial black holes is actually there, we have sort of a order one chance of seeing these events which is pretty exciting because even if you don't think there are FFPs there, there is still you know, observational motivation to probe this region of parameter space because we've seen something there, at least in the different observations. Now, I will say we finished our first search of uh, 1.3 million stars in, in uh, one of these sectors, and we flagged 272,000 events. Um, however, they then had to go through a lot, a lot, a lot of very stringent cuts to make sure that they actually look like microlensing events. At the end of the day, only two passed. Um, this is already a little bit outdated because the uh, one of these, um, we were able to uh, correlate with features in other sector observations to declare probably more likely to be a variable star than it is to be a microlensing event. Um, although sort of that doesn't really fit either, but it's, it's certainly not a free floating plan. Um, however, it does leave one, uh, and I will say, having looked at a lot of microlensing curves, it's a pretty beautiful looking curve. It does look a lot like microlensing. The interpretation is a bit difficult because it would point towards sort of a high mass planet, which are, given that power law, pretty rare. Um, so hey, maybe it's a primordial black hole. The question is, how are we going to find out? And so that will finally bring me to part four here. We're going to talk about discriminating multiple lens populations. But I'll pause once more for questions before we get to that. What, what sort of mass was, you said high, high mass, how, how high? Yeah, looks more, so unfortunately, we can't measure finite source for that light curve, which means that we can't get a good mass estimate, but it sets a lower bound of like 50 Earth masses. Okay, so no, we're not into compact object territory like neutral star. No, 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 no. it's still planetary, but like, 50 Earth masses is, is a tough prospect in terms of in terms of likelihood for the free floating planet mass distribution. We're, we're expecting to see things that are like Mars masses. There's just so many more of them. Um, so yeah, it, interpretationally questionable, but you know, it does look like a microlensing curve. So we want to, I will also say we're doing all the other sectors. So there's 75 sectors, I think, something like that. Um, and we're going down to 16 mag, which we have access to data that will do that. Um, so we expect at least an order of magnitude, if not to increase in the amount of data volume that we have to go through. So even if this sector doesn't end up yielding anything that is a free floating planet, you know, hands down clearly, um, you know, we still have a lot of stars to go through and a lot of light curves to go through. This is sort of more of a preliminary test, if you will. The other thing I was going to ask, so these, these six Ogle events, um, 
Are they are they sort of unambiguously microlensing events? They're not sort of just flaring a star or something like that. I, I think they're not flares. Flares are usually pretty easy to tag because they're highly asymmetric. Um, look, we don't know what they are. They look like microlensing events. They pass all the ogle checks. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's whatever the, the best fitting model is, is microlensing. Okay, fine. Do you know that it's microlensing? No. Um, but I think you can be fairly, fairly confident about it. Mm, yeah, I was going to ask another question. So what do you think about, let's say, dark stars or something? Couldn't they be lensed as well? How about we talk about that when I get to my slide on dark stars? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that everybody is coupled in enough to already anticipate most of what I'm going to say, but man, it does really spoil some of the punchlines. <laughs> um, okay, good. So let's move on to part four then before you know we run out of time here. So how are we actually going to discriminate PBHs from FFPs? Well, here's the rub. PBHs and FFPs are identical in microlensing observations, right? On an event by event basis, you cannot do it. And this is simply because it's a purely mass related effect so if you have an Earth mass PBH or an Earth mass free floating planet, it does the exact same thing to passing light rays and your light curve looks exactly the same. So what do we do? We pack up shop, we say, we'll never know, we go home, we cry a little bit. Um, no, what we do is we leverage the fact that in the future, we're gonna have statistics um, because PBHs and free floating planets are expected to have very different mass distributions. So there's this one that's a big falling power law to these self-similar scattering processes. Um, and then PBHs have this sort of narrow scale dependent uh, distribution that you expect. And so because of that, you can do a statistical discrimination where you say, is there an anomalous population living within this background of free floating planets? And right now we can't do that. We have a handful of events, but with Roman, we will be able to do that. And so this is just to show that ultimately you don't know the masses, so you can't do it with, from the mass distribution, but you can do it from the, the time scales, as I mentioned previously. Um, so using these event uh, distributions, these time scales, um, we were able to show that, yes, here's your plot. This is Roman sensitivity, um, not to just detection, but to, at 95% confidence, identifying an anomalous subpopulation of primordial black holes within a background of free-floating planets, right? This is the sensitivity that you'll be able to do with that um, for a variety of widths of your primordial black holes, that's sigma over there, for a variety of normalizations of your power law for free-floating planets, that's N over there. Um, and in all of these cases, we well surpass this ogle hint region, right? And so Roman will unambiguously be able to say whether or not there really is some sort of anomalous population of PB, uh, PBHs that are, that are living in that parameter space as suggested by the Ogle observations. So that's all very exciting. Um, however, I can't come here and not talk about axions, right? So I gotta, I gotta drop in a little bit here, um, which is, but wait, there's more. So as was just asked, Rome is sensitive to other dark matter structures as well, including extended dark matter structures, which was the topic of a paper I put out recently, um, just got accepted in uh, APJL. Um, and so one of these, for example, is axion stars, right? Um, axions are you know, hypothetical new particles. There are people in the audience who know quite a bit about them. Um, and in some cases, they can sort of collapse and form these objects, these axion stars, puffy collections of axions. Um, but those are just heavy, so they lens two. And so what happens is that you can do the same thing, right? And so this is sort of the, the sensitivity that Roman will have to axion stars, depending on how broad your axion star is. That's that R90 there, setting, setting the scale of how compact versus sort of distributed it is. Um, but one of the things I think is actually kind of neat about this is that because these aren't point-like lenses, because these actually have some distribution and light can pass through them, um, it induces interesting features in the light curve occasionally. Uh, these are the presence of caustic features, for example. And these caustics, which are these sort of uh, narrow peaks in the light curve where this blue curve is sort of the effective, you know, 
uh, uh, you know, point lens model where it's just a big Pachinsky curve, you get these additional call steps, right? And what's neat about that is that you don't need the statistics any longer. If you can observe the caustics, then on an event-by-event -event basis, you can discriminate from some point lens. And even more interestingly, the presence of the caustics and where they are in the light curve tells you something about the microphysics of that star, of that axion star. So sort of an interesting thing to note. I think it's a, a, a nice motivation for going after this. And we'll be able to with Roman. So with that, I will conclude. I will remind you what we talked about in part one. We talked about what microlensing was. Um, it's a potent technique to detect otherwise unobservable astrophysical bodies. In part two, we talked about what are good targets for it. So this was primordial black holes, but also free floating planets, both of which are exciting in their own right. In part three, we talked about uh, my efforts to repurpose existing observations with the test satellite uh, in order to look for these in now. And then in part four, we'll talk about the future and what Roman's going to be able to do for us in terms of discriminating multiple subpopulations. And so with that, I will thank you. Conclude. Oh. I'm just curious. You said you have so many stars that you look at. Like, how do you actually go through all of these and then flag events? And then pop them. Like, do you use, use machine learning? Like, what do you? Like? No, no, no machine learning. Surprisingly, uh -huh. surprisingly, I know in this era that's a. That's, uh -huh. No, it's legitimately like a good old-fashioned LHC cut flow, where you go through and you know, for example, like let's see how asymmetric the curve is. If it's asymmetric, it's probably a flare. Kill it. Um, let's go. One of the huge back, huge backgrounds is asteroids. So you have to go through and you have to use like single linkage clustering of asteroids on the sky kill all of those, go query, you know, the JPL ephemeris database. If there's an asteroid anywhere nearby, kill that event. Um, you look for variable stars, you look for uniqueness of the event, because these things are so rare that if you see two brightenings in the same light curve, definitely not microlensing by a free floating planet. Um, so yeah, you just go through and you cut and you cut and you cut, and surprisingly, you're left with very little. Um, and that's sort of what we'd expect, yeah. You have that PBH distribution that had some scale on it. Yeah. Is that just someone's model for what PBHs will be like? Because I think there's a whole bunch of different things. So that's, so, so the point that I was trying to make with the PBHs is, is that there's a lot of models to make PBHs, right? You pick your favorite. I, I was wondering why Earth mass black holes would be favored over any other mass. Uh, oh, I mean, they wouldn't. Yeah. Earth mass, no, no, no. My, my only point with that is that usually a particular mass scale is set. Whether it's Earth mass or something else, I mean, who knows? Yeah, because in terms of Hawking radiation, when you look at um, uh, Hawking's paper, you know, you can get down to a mass lower than the Earth. So if they were, so there's a mass spectrum up to the point of evaporation, then there's actually, like, you can get lower than Earth, like moon, lower than moon mass even. Yeah, there's, there's a whole asteroid gap, which I think I showed a few times. Um, right, sorry, I missed at the beginning. Of the no, time. yeah, I, I, I gave a little, a little pressies on it at the very beginning of motivation. But yeah, there's a huge asteroid gap. You can fill in wherever you want. Yeah. I mean, one thing to note is that if it's Earth mass PBHs, they're not all of the dark matter, right? They're a sub oh, no, no, Definitely not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's one thing to say that planets are ejected from developing solar systems. It's another thing to say exactly how many and exactly with what timing and with what profiles and oh. so on. Um, and an awful lot of things follow power laws and the fact that you saw a power law, well, I mean, knock me down with a feather, it follows a power law. Um, I, I, I would also say seeing a power law when you have about 20 events is also fitting a power law no, but, I'm, but, right, but I'm, I'm looking forward to Roman and assuming oh, that... Yes, yes. That how well do you think you will discriminate some of the currently controversial questions in solar system formation? You know, with the... this is music to my ears because one of the things that I was working on just this morning is this project with Lawrence Livermore. Um, where we are reconstructing, we are using uh, like full Roman simulations, like an entire galactic simulation model, um, and the actual 
image level analysis of hypothetical Roman data to make estimates of how well we will be able to measure the free floating planet mass function, both with Roman alone and simultaneous parallax measurements from, for example, Euclid, which will narrow those bounds. Um, and the answer is, you know, with the sufficient statistics, you can reconstruct these things and pull out interesting features. Um, so for example, the presence of an Einstein desert, um, which is some sort of uh, gap between like the failed star population and the terrestrial population. Um, so still a work in progress. I saw some awesome plots this morning and uh, yeah. And so look forward to that at some point. Okay. So do you, is there any difference um, between free floating planets and the priority black holes in terms of the distribution on the sky, like in towards the galactic center? Sure is. Yes. And so going sort of to the, uh, the, the discussion we were having earlier today, you know, for me as a dark matter theorist originally, I use what I can, right? I, I take what I get in terms of observations because very few people are going to do some dedicated survey just for me, um, which is why we wanted to leverage what we know Roman will do. However, another way of trying to discriminate is doing a statistical analysis of sort of, uh, you know, along the galactic disk versus, for example, out of plane. Because if primordial black holes are dark matter, they follow some NFW profile. Whereas free floating planets are usually pretty close to the stars they were ejected from. So they track them. So you have wildly different spatial distributions as well. That's something to test if we have sufficient statistics, we'll also be able to do because it sort of looks all over the place, but it only really goes down to like two, three kiloparsecs. So not really, but yes. That's only true if you're surveying a large volume. If it's local, they're both the same, I think. Well, that's what I was saying. It's like with Roman, sure, but like yeah, test, you know, two, three kiloparsec is. Yeah, exactly. What about approaching it from the other side? I mean, I was just running some numbers. I mean, okay. if, this, if the star is old, then an ejected planet could be anywhere, basically. Yeah. But if the star is young, yeah. then the planet will still... Why can't you look somewhere near a stellar nursery or a reef somewhere that would, would have been associated with planetary formation in the last 10 million years? And so, absolutely, stare at stare at, uh, stare at a non occluded region of space nearby that. So that's that's an awesome point. That's an uh, and and yeah, I, my my guess is that you're an astronomer. No, really? <laughs> wow, I was way off. Well, you're dialed in. So this is something that I was thinking about. Absolutely, but um, the biggest issue is that the clusters, the star forming clusters don't have high enough stellar densities in order to get appreciable rates of microlensing. Um, so there are campaigns though, to do uh, direct imaging in these regions to look for sort of the like very high mass end that we were talking about, um, which is certainly interesting, especially because some of those are expected to have exomoons, if you will, free floating planet moons around them. And there's a, awesome proposal that did not get picked up from Roman, but I don't think is super dead, um, to point towards one of these stellar nurseries and look for these exomoons, um, which I think would be just so cool. So there's one question online. Jeremy, do you wanna, do you wanna ask now? Uh, yes, I wanted to know um, what you think of the Rubin telescope as a microlensing machine. Rubin is awesome. Rubin's really cool. Um, the problem is its cadence isn't really that uh, uh, fast enough to do um, the sort of FFP stuff that I want to be doing. Um, and it also is uh, uh, Earth-based, which comes with all its own complexities. Um, so there's been some work trying to figure out whether or not, you know, Rubin and Roman together will be able to do some sort of like parallax thing. Um, from the most recent things I've seen, Ruben doesn't help you out that much when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, but I think one really exciting prospect for Ruben is that we will be constraining the very low mass end of the ejected population because it's going to see a lot of what are called ISOs or interstellar objects flying through the solar system. So that's sort of on the, on, you know, that's orders of magnitude lower than a terrestrial mass FFP, but it comes from the same processes. And so we'll have at least another sort of pivot on all of the interstellar nomads that are flying around out there in the dark. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, um, 
Thanks for a great talk. And I will a little bit, let's say, devil's advocate. Of course, if you say that you observe this core and it's it's a, not a planet, it's some compact object, right? But for instance, people knew that there was, let's say, a black hole in the center of our galaxy, but we cannot announce that it's a black hole until we know the size because gravity is universal, which tells you if you have a black hole, then size is what you learn. Now, instead of planet, you could have, let's say, some object which is bigger, let's say, 10 times bigger than Schwarzschild radius that won't be a black hole and fits, let's say, with everything. And it will look like primordial, black hole. like for instance, like... Oh, yeah, no, no I understand your question. No, so, so, so how you can measure, let's say, size? Because with these techniques, it's uh, impossible. No, no, so... so, so the result, right, like put, put most honestly, the Roman results will say, is there an anomalous population that does not follow a free-floating planet distribution living in a background of free-floating planets? Yeah, exactly. They will not say, this has to be deported black holes. It could be axion stars. It could be tiny little NFW mini halos or something. Um, all it will tell you is that there's something, there is something there, which right now we cannot do. Uh, there is no way to say, let's say, the size is near, let's say, the fortune. With this technique, I see there is no way. You don't know. I mean, it's it's to, it's to generate the maps, right? The light the light curve, unless there are extended lens effects. Is, sure. I should... this, that's what I'm saying. With this technique, it's impossible. Is there, there is any other possibility, any other measurements outside of the lensing? To, to know if a black hole is a black hole. No, let's say to know if, well, what is the radius? Because if you know something has this mass and the radius is a partial radius, you for sure know it's, it's a... It would need to be accompanied. It would, there would need to be something else. It would yeah. Be accreting, they, they would... This is why isolated black holes are so, so... I mean, so uh, this is an entirely other rabbit hole to go down, but we know so little about the isolated black hole like traditional, not primordial, isolated black hole population oh. in the galaxy. We've seen like six, maybe. Yeah, right? because it's very hard to measure. Let's exactly, say. without something around it to light it up, right? How will the Roman survey improve that knowledge, by the way? Wide, wide binaries, I think. Uh, yeah, also wide binaries. Yeah, we've got all sorts of things going on. I would call yes. a wide binary isolated sense, like a... Uh, sorry, let me answer this question and then we'll get back to that. So uh, that is... Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, so there's a, there's a researcher at Berkeley, um, Jessica Liu, who is, who is uh, uh, leading this initiative for Roman. Um, but Roman is, is, a, is a planet. I mean, the, the Galactic Bulge Time Domain Survey is supposed to be for planets. So um, getting, you know, a different pointing and stuff that would even do better for isolated mass or isolated uh, sort of solar mass black holes has been tough to wrangle. Sorry, because the optimization of the cadence is different? Or... Yeah, and also where you want to point might be a little bit different. Um, but so Jessica is leading this initiative and she's she's has some really, really cool results that she's already published and sort of expected yields and constraints on isolated, um, isolated solar mass black holes. Um, and sorry, you said wide binaries. Very wide binaries are kind of isolated because they're not accreting throughout the Roche flow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, everything. But you know, see, but you see jitter, right? Because it's interacting gravitationally with the. Uh, what I mean is that you can think of it as isolated, in the sense that it's a naked black hole you can study without accretion, because all the black holes we know about are accreting. Sure, but it's. I mean, it is still accompanied in the sense that it is bound to something that will show, for example, radial velocity variations or show astrometric. Yeah, but what I'm saying is finding these black holes, which are very rare, which are wide binary, as in not accreting through the Roche lobes, are rare. I mean, Gaia has found two of them. Okay. And uh, I think there's only two others known. And I don't care how you find them, but finding them is really good. Oh. <laughs> because, oh. And if it's not accreting and messing you up because of... Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I thought it was a criticism. This is just... No, 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 no. Far from yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So naked black holes uh, for future study are going to be extremely important. Yeah. yeah run, 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 for, for example, yeah. watch... Watching bits. Watch, yeah, okay, you got the idea. No, absolutely. I mean, that's it, one of the things is it's going to quote unquote complete 
the demographic of exoplanets, meaning that right now transit can only observe within an AU. It will observe from one AU out to infinity, all the way into the free-floating planet thing. So we will actually be able to see these very, very wide-bound orbits as well. So what I'm saying is, since 2000 and before 2019, we didn't. I did. I don't think we know of a single black hole, correct, other than fire from its association with something. To yes. go to Bruce's point, but it, but uh, what Kareem and others have done with Gaia is look at astrometric, very very wide binaries, yeah. which are so wide they're barely in contact. So yeah. Google has electrons, and they, yeah. they're so they're so really coupling. Yeah. And, and, and they're very rarely known. I, I believe future servers will find dozens of those. Wow, that's, that's what I'm saying, is Roman will absolutely be sensitive to that. Yeah. Absolutely. And actually, there's been talk about doing a dedicated astrometry pipeline for Roman as well, which was never in the mission parameters, but it's going to be so good at astrometry that it feels like, why not? Um, but we need someone dedicated at IPAC to do that. So, yeah. Maybe I can ask. <laughs> So I know that in this asteroid mass gap, there's this other issue to do with like the diffraction of the light around the yeah, lens. Yeah, wave optics effects yeah. and stuff. Is, is there any inf interesting information in that? Because just in terms of getting yes. more stuff out of the micro. You know, if you can do it properly, the wave optics effects can actually break some of those degeneracies. Like on an event by event basis, you can actually measure things about like the, the mass of the lens, for example. This sometimes happens, I believe, in like lensing of fast radio bursts or something, but don't quote me and I'm starting to regret that this is getting recorded, but uh, <laughs> nobody leave angry comments. Um, but yes, no, the, 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 uh, those do tell you things if you can do them properly, but it's hard to observe correctly. Does, does Roman have capabilities to measure this? Or is it, I don't actually know what, it, what type of instrument it is. I, I, it's, an, it's a near infrared telescope and I have no idea. So in the parallax, oh sorry, was it someone else? In, in the parallax discussion, you had a cartoon with twin telescopes in orbit. Yeah. Is, is that actually the proposal, twin telescopes in orbit, or is it something else? Well, uh, that's a toughie. So we proposed, I mean, I, I was on a proposal for something called Cleopatra, which has not been killed yet. Bye, thank you. Um, which has not been killed yet, but also has not been given life yet, uh, which is basically to send um, sort of a SMEX mission up into space in a geo orbit, whereas Roman's going to be in L2. Try to get a nice baseline for parallax measurements just by doing dedicated simultaneous observations. So a, a secondary telescope, so something that's not as good as Roman, yeah. but will do for the but purpose. will give you that parallax, exactly. Yeah, and so that was the proposal. Um, what I will also say is that um, there will be another telescope in space, granted in L2 as well, so... Baseline is a little bit different. It's a little bit less sensitive to, to the stuff that we were interested in. Um, but China is launching sort of its own Roman called Earth 2.0 that will also be pointing towards the bulge and will also be sort of similarly sensitive. Um, and so we will have two sets of observations. Going to cooperate on pointy. But there's a question of how much there's going to be crosstalk. So who knows? It would be great if we could make it happen. Um, but I don't hold my breath for it. What about putting something at L3? L3, you say? Radio. Of all I, 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 it, I have, I am not associated with, nor have I heard any proposals to put something in L3. Uh, however, if you want to self-fund a satellite for me, I will <laughs> happily launch it to L3 for you. I don't know how. I don't know how much delta v you need to get to L three. Probably a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think you can just ride share it. <laughs> well, it's unstable, isn't it? L unstable. You tell me. L three champion. <laughs> <laughs> just occurred to me. Um, silly question. Uh, is there hypothetically a way you could find the ogle events in the test data and if you did would that give you any information oh my god that would be so great uh, unfortunately ogle was long before tests started observing however we have been looking at uh, events where both kmt net and tests were pointing in the same direction and we have been able to pull out a bunch of those and we're hoping to maybe try to do some parallax or something with that but test doesn't orbit far enough away to have a good baseline and i will say it's a little bit noisy so who knows? But but uh, but yes, we have pulled out some KMT net events, which is nice and heartening. I think it's called KMT net. 
that came through net not know about this before. <laughs> Oh, the fact that there's two that are so similarly yeah. named. I mean, KMT net was before KM3 net. But before, Correct. Yeah. Yes. So I. No, I'm still being recorded. Never mind. Well, I can, I can I, stop the recording. It's, it's 